today I wanted to do this video to talk a little bit about a practice that I've just published on Insight Timer called Breathing Loving Awareness. And this is something that I've done in my own personal practice for quite a long time now. It's helped me a lot and it's something that I use with almost every one of my coaching and counseling clients. And the reason why is because the effect is so immediate and tangible, so fruitful. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what it is and how it works. And I'm not going to actually go through the full process in this video, but I will put a link to the Insight Timer practice if you want to go ahead and do that practice yourself. So why do we do a loving awareness, uh, breathing loving awareness practice? So I use this in general when there's something that's quite um, sort of triggering for something that's really emotionally um, tangible that we don't really know how to process, we don't know how to learn from it, move through it, and ultimately let it go, or, or more accurately, integrate it into our system. And when we have memories and triggers and even traumas that are held like that within us, then it has an impact on our subconscious mind, which then impacts uh, how we think and how we behave and how we show up in the world. So when you're talking about emotions and traumas and triggers like this, you're talking about a visceral experience. You can think of it as symptoms. So you might have, um, it changes the way that you're breathing. You might notice a change in your body temperature. You might notice that you become either more or less active, like you might become more fidgety, more nervous, or you might become a bit more unconscious and docile and kind of want to check out a little bit. There's all different types of ways that we show up in response to uncomfortable memories, feelings and emotions. And so what's important in the entire practice is that we really um, respect that memory as a visceral imprint. It's something that we hold in our body and we experience it in our body. And along with those sensations, you might have imagery as well. You might have um, visions of the experience and the memory. And like I said, this can be something that is from um, a trauma that can be quite intense, or it might be something a bit more subtle. Or it might just be an everyday trigger, something that happened this week that um, you're still carrying with you, even though it's been a week. And so how do we respect that process? Well, one of the first ways is we acknowledge that emotions are normal and important. They're there for a reason. When we experience an emotion, we're experiencing that emotion so that we can know that there's something that needs to be tended to. There might be an unmet need or something that we're not clear about, or there might be a boundary that's being crossed. And so the emotion helps us know that we need to pay attention. And when we experience emotion, we also experience that it's visible. So we cry, our body language changes, our um, tone of voice and what we say and how we say it changes. And whether we give someone eye contact, these are all ways that we're letting the people around us know that there's something going on within us that needs to be addressed. And that's important because we're communal. We come from living in um, groups and tribes. And so if there's a problem or something that's not addressed within one person in the tribe, that affects the rest of the tribe. So we need to know. We need to know when something's going on for someone. So if we think about it like a communication system from our nervous system letting us know that there's something that needs to be handled there, something that needs to be taken care of. Then 
we can start to embrace this as a positive experience, that, there's, that it's an important and normal and positive experience. And so that understanding helps, and then also how we relate to it. And so when we're breathing loving awareness, the general vibe of how you want to relate to your experience of your emotion is with uh, curiosity and mindfulness and with a sense of compassion, self-compassion and love and kindness and gentleness. Because if we think about emotions and how I explained their, their use and how they work, we can also think that when a baby first comes into the world, that it doesn't have the ability to meet its own needs and it doesn't have the ability to regulate itself. So what it does know how to do is communicate. The first thing it does is something, I know that there's something that I need, so I'm going to communicate it. And out comes the cry. Out comes the, the loud noises. And we're calling to us, our tribe, our primary caretaker and our community. And we're saying, over here, over here. I'm not okay. There's something that needs to be addressed here. And we know that through sound and through the way the baby's behaving. And so this is our first behavior, really. And it's our first mode of communication. And what happens is, if we're successful, we'll call one of our primary caretakers over to us and they will tend to us. They will do the two things that we can't do. They'll help meet the need to start to see, do you need to be changed? Do you need some food or some drink or do you need a cuddle? Or um, maybe you're a little bit cold or maybe you're too warm. And then the other thing is that the, the person will help to regulate. So we usually do that by holding the baby tenderly and looking into the baby's eyes and maybe moving a little bit and speaking, telling the baby some, some gentle, kind words. It's okay. It's all right, I'm here. You'll be okay. And so when we do that, the baby starts to get the message, oh, it's okay. Even though I can't meet my own need, I can communicate. And when I communicate, then I have the parent come forward or the primary caretaker or someone from my tribe comes forward. And so that's, that's when it works well. And, and obviously it doesn't always work well. Obviously there's things like neglect that can happen where these cries for the baby gets ignored. Or it can be that the attention comes, but it comes with judgment and anger and aggression. Like, oh, be quiet. Why are you, why are you so unhappy? Can't you just be um, a calm, quiet baby or something like that? And so when we get those experiences, those less than ideal responses to a cry as a baby, we start to develop our habits in how we're going to respond to the world around us. How we're going to respond when we feel uncomfortable or emotional or that there's a need that we have. So we learn how the world works by the way our tribe and our primary caretakers respond to us. And then we adapt the way we behave because of that. So if I was a baby and I was crying to be supported and soothed in that way, then I might have someone come to me and if they are angry at me, I might, I'll probably get more upset to begin with. But I might also eventually learn that they're less angry if I ask for less. And so therefore, I'm going to need to either learn how to regulate my own emotion, which would happen later on, um, in later stages of development, or I would learn how to try and meet my own needs without asking. Or if the person was neglecting me, and I realized that my cries, my communication that I need something is never going to be responded to, then I stop bothering. And so how do I cope with an overwhelming emotion and sensation when I know that no one's going to come and support me? Is I have to disassociate from that feeling. Otherwise, the threat and feeling that I could die would be really um, present and it's too much for a young baby to have that. So I learn, okay, I have to disassociate. I have to take my mind and my awareness off my physical experience and up into something that's more cerebral. So these are the types of ways that we can respond. However, I'm giving you that context because 
as we get older, we carry forward some of that behavior. So you might find yourself, if there's something going on inside of you that feels uncomfortable, you might have um, the habit of sort of just not knowing what it is and not being prompted to lean in and figure out what it is. And you just kind of accept that discomfort is just the normal way of life, that it's just um, what you expect. And that might come from one of those upbringing situations that I had just mentioned, where you, where you feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't need to do anything about that. Another way we might respond is, I better suppress that because if, if I, um, you know, if I speak up too loudly about this, I might be rejected or criticized. Or we might learn to ignore it altogether and disassociate. It's like, it's really painful right now, but I'm just going to ignore all of that. I'm going to focus on something in my mind or something outside of me or someone else's needs. And then we kind of mimic, in a way, what we had to learn to survive in those first sort of three to seven years. And so what we're doing here is we're kind of reconditioning ourselves with how we relate to what an emotion is and what it's for. And we do that by pretty much doing the job that the primary caretaker was supposed to do, which is to come in and give full presence and full attention to the message that the nervous system is giving, that there's something that's not okay. To be interested and curious, what's the need here? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Did something hurt you? Did someone hurt you? Do I have to protect you more? And so you get to know um, what's going on and what the communication is. And then you can help to meet that need once you've gone through that process. And if you fully give the presence and the care and the kindness and the interest in what the need is behind the emotion to a baby, then they usually stop crying. And that stopping crying that happens is because the baby feels regulated, not because they're suppressing or ignoring um, or disassociating from what's going on. So we do the same thing for ourselves. So this practice is designed to, to kind of recondition the way that you process your emotions um, through almost through reparenting yourself. And so you do that by relating to the emotion almost as though the emotion, and I mean the sensation of the emotion within your body, is a child. So I'll talk you through a little bit of how the process goes. You get yourself in a safe environment where you feel like you can really go into this. And you want to work with something that isn't too triggering as well. You don't want to up this, upset yourself more than you're, you're willing to handle. And that's why it can also help to do this work with a somatic therapist, like the work that I do. Um, but you can do this yourself. You just need to check in with yourself what, what um, level of depth and what memory and what trigger you're willing to go into here. So you choose uh, something that comes to mind, something that's either recent or from the past. And you choose something that's relevant and useful for you to go into. And you ground yourself first with a few deep breaths. And then and you check in with your body, you feel with how you're going, and you allow this memory to come to your mind. So let's just use an example. Let's just say someone had an argument with their partner two weeks ago, and they still feel the fire inside them from that experience. So that's a sign that, that the need that was not met or the boundary that was crossed has not been addressed. If it's still there, if you're still carrying it forward, it means that it's not being tended to and cared for. So it's going to keep on sounding the alarm or it's going to give up, but then it's going to go down deeper, which will subconsciously affect the way that you think and behave and relate in the world. So we then check in with our body. We bring to mind the memory and we try and get in tune with the feeling that was there when the event happened and we check in in the body if there's somewhere in the body where that sensation is most obvious you might feel some really common places are um, the throat and the neck um, the belly or the heart or the shoulders or the hands sometimes so 
if you really tune into that, sometimes you can feel the emotion come on almost as intensely as it did in the moment that happened. And if that does happen, our job is to become curious and gentle and kind. We bring all of our awareness into that part of our body and we relate to the sensation as the emotion itself. And we re relate to it in a way where it would be like relating to a small child or a baby that was experiencing that emotion. And we try to avoid going into a story about what happened and whose fault it was. And you want to stay with the sensation. And you might have spontaneously images come forward and that's okay, but always coming back into the sensation wherever it is in the body. And by bringing this awareness to the sensation, Awareness has this, I describe it as like an organizing principle to it. So we're bringing in the space of awareness into the body, into the sensation and the seed of the memory and the trigger and the emotion. And there's something about that awareness that has an organizing or harmonizing principle to it. And the way that we work with the sensation is we notice all about it. You look at how big is it? How small is it? Is it really dense? Is it heavy? Is it light? Is there a numbness there? We just try to get kind of curious. You don't have to dialogue about it too much, but just kind of bring your awareness to it and notice the different qualities. It might be bigger than your body. It might be in one part of the body and then comes up to another part as well. It might be changing. It might be hot or cold. And just explore that visceral experience, that, that sensory um, experience that you're having with it. And as you're noticing these different qualities of the sensation, then you can start to breathe into the sensation itself. And so obviously when you breathe, air comes in and fills up your lungs and your, and your lungs contract and it comes out your nose. So there's, you're using your imagination, you're using your mind to imagine as though the air that you're breathing in is coming into your body and flowing into the sensation. So if it was in my stomach in a particular process, I would imagine whatever shape and size and density and feeling that emotion is, that the air that I'm breathing is going right into the center of it. And then when I breathe out, I'm breathing right out from the center of it and letting go whatever wants to be let go. And we do that with the curiosity and the gentleness and the love and, and, the, and deeping, deepening and slowing down the breath as we do it helps as well, because that slow, deep breathing really helps regulate our nervous system, which helps us change our relationship to the sensation. And then if you feel to, you can also start to have dialogue with the sensation. You can ask a question to the sensation. Is there anything that you want to tell me? You might notice that some words come up or some images come up or maybe nothing. And the response isn't as important as the time and the sort of um, intention with which you go in and you're just showing genuine interest, like you would with a baby or a child. Oh, what's wrong, darling? Tell me what's wrong. What's happening? You do the same thing. What's going on? Is there something you want to tell me? And you feel it and you watch, and you watch. Is there something that I need to know? Is there something that you need? Maybe you could even ask that. I'm just imagining speaking these words into the sensation and then you're feeling and breathing with the sensation after you've asked the question, just sitting with it. You might find that the sensation tingles or moves, that it grows, moves location. But what's important isn't the result, it's the intention and the presence and awareness and the sort of um, energy of love and kindness that you bring to it. And you do this as long as you need to. You just sit and feel and breathe and inquire. Sit and feel and breathe and inquire. And you do that for either until you feel like um, that the cycle is complete. You intuitively know that, yeah, that feels met now. Or that you would intuitively know and feel that it's enough, that there might be more there, but that's as much as I can, I'm comfortable dealing with or working with right now. And so at that point, you can put your hands on that part of your body and you can kind of just have a moment of gratitude, like thank you, sort of letting that your nervous system know, like I'm always here in support of you. I'm not going to reject you. I'm not going to abandon you. 
I'm not going to criticize you. I'm just, just going to be with you in loving awareness. So if you need to show, you, show yourself again, I'm, I'm here for you. And then you can finish off the cycle through taking in some nice, long, slow, deep breaths, and then starting to move your body, open up your eyes. You can even rub your hands together until they get warm and put them on your eyes. And these are kind of grounding techniques that bring you back into more of sort of like an interactive day-to-day -day, um, sense of your body, opening your eyes, noticing what's happening in the room. And then you can go ahead and you can either just go about your day if you feel clear, or if you feel like you need to explore what you experienced, you can do a journal about it, or you can video yourself and talk about what you experienced or, or take it to a therapy session and talk to a good friend, a good trusted friend or a therapist about it. So if you want to know any more about that process, feel free to um, write some questions in below or email me. I'm happy to take you through the process. This is something that I often will spontaneously go into this process in a therapy session. If somebody starts to feel something come up, we then go into that process and start to process it on the spot. Also, like I said, the link to the Insight Tummy Meditation will be um, in the description below. So I hope that was useful and interesting for you. I'll see you next time.